Lesson 13 for June 23 to 29, ready for teaching on June 30, the return of our Lord Jesus. Sabbath afternoon, June 23. Before we start, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we look forward to the day when Jesus will come again. He promised it, the prophets promised it. And you have promised it in so many ways. And as we study about that this week, we pray that our hope may be strengthened and that we may more fully understand your great love for us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our memory text this week is Matthew chapter 24 and verse 27. For as the lightning cometh out of the east and shineth even unto the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Let's read that again. Matthew 24 verse 27. For as the lightning cometh out of the east, and shineth even unto the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. The poet T.S. Eliot began a poem with the line, In my beginning is my end. However succinct, his words carry a powerful truth. In origins exist endings. We see echoes of this reality in our name, Seventh-day Adventist, which carries two basic biblical teachings. Seventh day for the Sabbath of the Ten Commandments, a weekly memorial of the six-day creation of life on earth, and Adventist, pointing to the second coming of Jesus, in which all the hopes and promises of Scripture, including the promise of eternal life, will find their fulfilment. However distant in time the creation of the world, our beginning, is from the second coming of Jesus, our end, or at least the end of this sinful existence, these events are linked. The God who created us is the same God who will return and in an instant, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, as it says in 1 Corinthians 15.52, will bring about our ultimate redemption. In our beginning, indeed, we find our end. This week, we will talk about the final of all final events, at least as far as our present world is concerned, the second coming of our Lord Jesus. Sunday, June 24, the Day of the Lord. However much we tend to think of the second coming of Jesus as a New Testament teaching alone, that's not true. Of course, only after the first coming of Jesus, after his death, resurrection and ascension, were we given a fuller and richer revelation of the truth surrounding the second coming. But, as with so much else in the New Testament, the Old Testament reveals hints and shadows of this crucial truth long before it will happen. With the doctrine of the second coming of Jesus, the New Testament authors didn't reveal a new truth. Instead, they greatly enhanced a truth that already had been revealed in the Bible. Only now, in light of the crucified and risen Saviour, can the promise of the second coming be understood and appreciated more fully. Question. Read the following texts. What do they teach us about the second coming of Jesus? First of all, Isaiah 13, verses 6 and 9. Wail for the day of the Lord is at hand. It will come as destruction from the Almighty. Behold, the day of the Lord comes, cruel with both wrath and fierce anger, to lay the land desolate, and he will destroy its sinners from it. And Zechariah chapter 14, verse 9. And the Lord shall be king over all the earth. In that day it shall be, the Lord is one and his name one. And Daniel chapter 12 and verse 1. At that time Michael shall stand up, the great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people. And there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation, even to that time. And at that time your people shall be delivered, every one who is found written in the book. There is no question that the day of the Lord will be a day of destruction, and sorrow, and turmoil for the lost. But it is also a day of deliverance for all of God's people, those who are found written in the book. 
Uh, let's have a look at a couple of texts with this. Philippians chapter 4 and verse 3. And I urge you also, true companion, help these women who laboured with me in the gospel, with Clement also, and the rest of my fellow workers, whose names are in the book of life. And Revelation chapter 3 verse 5. He who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments, and I will not blot out his name from the book of life, but I will confess his name before my father, and before his angels. And Revelation 13, verse 8, All who dwell on the earth will worship him, whose names have not been written in the book of life of the Lamb, slain from the foundation of the world. This theme, that of the day of the Lord, as a time of judgment against the wicked, but also a time when God's faithful are protected and rewarded, is found first in the Old Testament. For instance, although some will face the Lord's fierce anger, those who heed the call to seek righteousness and seek humility will be hidden in the day of the Lord's anger, as it says in Zephaniah 2 verses 1 to 3. Question. Read Matthew chapter 24 verses 30 and 31. In what way do these verses show this same great dichotomy between the lost and the saved at the second coming of Jesus? Matthew 24, beginning at verse 30, Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they will gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven... To the other. And so, to finish today, as final events unfold, the side we are on will only become more apparent. What choices can and must we make now to make sure we're on the right side? Monday, June 25, Daniel and the Second Coming of Jesus Although many Jews in the time of Jesus expected the Messiah to overthrow the Romans and establish Israel as the most powerful nation of all, that's not what the advents of Jesus, either the first or the second, were to be about. Instead, God had something so much bigger in store for his faithful people than just a rearrangement of the old, sinful and fallen world. Perhaps nothing else in the Old Testament reveals as clearly as does Daniel 2 the truth that the new world does not grow out of the old one, but instead is a new and radically different creation. Daniel 2 shows the rise and fall of four great world empires, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and then finally Rome, which then breaks up into the nations of modern Europe. However, the statue that Nebuchadnezzar saw in his dream, symbolising the succession of these four major world powers, ends in a spectacular way. It does so in order to show the great disconnect between this world and the one that will come after the return of our Lord Jesus Christ. Question. Read Daniel chapter 2, verses 34, 35, 44 and 45. What do these verses teach about the fate of this world and the nature of the new one? Daniel chapter 2 verses 34 and 35 You watched while a stone was cut out without hands which struck the image on its feet of iron and clay and broke them in pieces. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver and the gold were crushed together and became like chaff from the summer threshing floors. The wind carried them away so that no trace of them was found. And the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. And Daniel chapter 44, sorry, Daniel chapter 2 and verses 44 and 45. And in the days of these kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people. It shall break in pieces and consume these kingdoms and it shall stand forever. Inasmuch as you saw that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and that it broke in pieces the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold, the great God 
has made known to the king what will come to pass after this. The dream is certain, and its interpretation is sure. These verses leave little ambiguity about what happens when Jesus returns. In Luke 20, verses 17 and 18, Jesus identified himself with this stone. Then he looked at them and said, What then is this that is written, The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone? Jesus identified himself with this stone, which crushed to powder all that was left of this world. The Aramaic of Daniel 2, verse 35, says that after the gold, silver, clay, iron and bronze were crushed, became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors, and the wind carried them away, that no place was found for them. That is, nothing is left of this old world after Jesus returns. Meanwhile, the stone that destroyed all trace of this old world became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. And this kingdom, which arises as a result of the second coming, is one that shall never be destroyed, and it shall stand forever. Daniel 2.44 In other words, only one of two endings awaits every human being who has ever lived on this planet. Either we will be with Jesus for eternity, or we will disappear into nothingness with the chaff of this old world. One way or another, eternity waits for us. Tuesday, June 26, Long-Term Prospects Question. Read Titus chapter 2, verse 13. What great hope do we have, and why? Titus 2, 13. Looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Describing his beliefs about the origins of our universe, a lecturer explained that about 13 billion years ago, an infinitely dense tiny mass popped out of nothing, and that mass exploded, and from that explosion our universe came into existence. Just how this infinitely dense tiny mass could just pop out of nothing, the lecturer didn't say. He just assumed by faith that it did. Now, as we noted in the introduction to this week's lesson, in our origins we find our endings. This is why, according to this lecturer, our endings aren't too hopeful, at least in the long run. The universe created from this infinitely dense tiny mass is doomed to eventual extinction, along with all that is in it, which includes humanity, of course. In contrast, the Bible concept of our origins is not only much more logical than this view, but also much more hopeful. Thanks to the God of origins, our long-term prospects are very good. We have so much to be hopeful for in the future, and this hope rests on the promise of Jesus' second coming. Question. Read Second Timothy chapter 4, verses 6 through to 8. What is Paul talking about here? And... In what is he putting his hope? Second Timothy 4, beginning at verse 6. For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. Finally there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord the righteous judge will give to me on that day, and not to me only, but also to all who have loved his appearing. Although Paul is soon to be executed, he lives in assurance of salvation and the hope of Christ's return, which Paul calls his appearing. A crown of righteousness awaits him, certainly not his own righteousness, but the righteousness of Jesus, upon which Paul knows his hope in the promise of the second coming rests, as he reads in 1 Timothy 1.15, This is a faithful saying, and worthy of all acceptance, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. Regardless of his immediate circumstances, which are dismal at best, in jail, waiting to be executed, Paul knows his long-term prospects are very good. 
and that is because he is looking at the big picture, not focusing on the immediate situation. And so to finish today, regardless of your own immediate circumstances, how can you have the same hope as Paul did? How can we learn to look at the big picture and the hope it offers us? Wednesday, June 27, in the clouds of heaven. However central and crucial the second coming is, according to the Bible, not all Christians see the event as a literal personal return of Jesus himself. Some argue, for instance, that the second coming of Jesus occurs not when Christ himself returns to earth, but when his spirit is made manifest in his church on earth. In other words, Christ's second coming is accomplished when the moral principles of Christianity are revealed in his people. How thankful we can be, however, that this teaching is false. If it were true, what long-term hope would we really have? Question. Read the following New Testament text about the second coming. What do they reveal about the nature of Christ's return? Matthew 24, verse 30. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And 1 Thessalonians 4, 16. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. And Matthew 26, verse 64, Jesus said to him, It is as you said, nevertheless I say to you, hereafter you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the power and coming on the clouds of heaven. And Revelation 1, verse 7, Behold, he is coming with clouds, and every eye will see him, even they who pierced him. And all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him. Even so... Amen. And Second Thessalonians 1, verses 7 through to 10. And to give you who are troubled rest with us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God, and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. These shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power when he comes in that day to be glorified in his saints and to be admired among all those who believe because our testimony among you was believed. The firmament appears to open and shut, Ellen White writes in The Great Controversy, page 637. The glory from the throne of God seems flashing through. The mountains shake like a reed in the wind, and ragged rocks are scattered on every side. There is a roar as of a coming tempest. The sea is lashed into fury. There is heard the shriek of a hurricane like the voice of demons upon a mission of destruction. The whole earth heaves and swells like the waves of the sea. Its surface is breaking up. Its very foundations seem to be giving way. Mountain chains are sinking. Inhabited islands disappear. The seaports that have become like Sodom for wickedness are swallowed up by the angry waters. Babylon the Great has come in remembrance before God to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. End of quote. The return of Jesus will be such a massive event that it literally will bring the world as we know it to an end. When it happens, everyone will know it too. What Jesus accomplished for us at the first coming fully will be made manifest at the second. So, to finish today. How should living with the reality of the second coming impact how we live now? How should it help us to remember what the really important things in life are? Thursday, June 28, The Living and the Dead 
Before raising his friend Lazarus from the tomb, Jesus uttered these words in John 11.25, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. But rather than just asking people to take his word about such an incredible claim, he then proceeded to raise Lazarus from death, who had been dead long enough for the corpse to start stinking, as it said in verse 39. Those who believe in Jesus do indeed die. However, as Jesus said, though they may die, they will live again. This is what the resurrection of the dead is all about. And this is what makes the second coming of Jesus so central to all our hopes. Question. According to these texts, what happens to the dead in Christ when Jesus returns? Romans 6 verse 5. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. And 1 Thessalonians 4.16. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. And 1 Corinthians 15, verses 42 to 44. So also is the resurrection of the dead. The body is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown in natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body, and there is a spiritual body. And 1 Corinthians 15, verses 53 to 55. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So, when this corruptible has put on incorruption, and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your sting? O Hades, where is your victory? The great hope of the second coming is that the resurrection from the dead that Jesus himself experienced will be what his faithful followers of all ages will experience as well. In his resurrection, they have the hope and assurance of their own. Question. What happens to those who are alive when Jesus returns? Well, we're going to look at two texts here. First of all, Philippians chapter 3, verse 21, who will transform our lowly body that it may be conformed to his glorious body according to the working by which he is able even to subdue all things to himself. And First Thessalonians 4, verse 17, then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. The faithful ones, alive when Jesus returns, will retain a physical body, but not in its present state. It will be supernaturally transformed into the same kind of incorruptible body that the ones raised from the dead will have as well. As we read in the Great Controversy, page 645, the living righteous are changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye, At the voice of God they were glorified. Now they are made immortal, and with the risen saints are caught up to meet the Lord, their Lord, in the air. And so to finish the day, make a list of all the things of this world that are so important to you that you would rather sacrifice eternal life in order to retain them. What's on the list? Friday, June 29. The second coming of Jesus isn't the epilogue, the appendix, or the afterward to the sad story of human sin and suffering in this fallen world. Instead, the second coming is the grand climax, the great hope of the Christian's faith. Without it, what would we have? The story of humanity just would go on and on, one miserable scene after another, one tragedy after another, until it all ends in death. Apart from the hope that Christ's return offers us, life is, as William Shakespeare wrote, a tale 
told by an idiot full of sound and fury, signifying nothing. End of quote. And yet, we have this hope because the Word of God confirms it for us again and again. We have this hope because Jesus ransomed us with his life, as it says in Mark 10.45. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. And Jesus is indeed coming back to get what he paid for. The stars in the heavens don't speak to us of the second coming. The birds chirping in the trees don't herald it. In and of themselves, these things might point to something good, something hopeful, about reality itself. But they don't teach us that one day, when Jesus returns, the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we shall be saved, as it says in 1 Corinthians 15.52. They don't teach us that one day we will look up and see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the power and coming with the clouds of heaven in Mark 14, verse 62. No, we know these things because they have been told to us in the word of God and we trust what the word promises us. And that brings us to our three discussion questions for this week. One, think about what it would mean if the second coming of Jesus really were nothing more than what some believe it is, the full expression of Christian principles in the lives of Christ's followers. However wonderful a display that would be, why in the end does it leave us without any hope? Two, why is the currently popular idea that the universe arose from nothing such a silly idea? Why would people promote such a notion, and why do some believe it? Why is belief in an eternally existent God who created all things so much more logical and rational an explanation for the universe? And three, share with your class the things you put on a list of what you find so important in this life that you would sacrifice the hope of eternity in order to keep them. What can you learn from one another about the contents of the lists? If people have nothing on their lists, how can we make sure, then, that nothing in our lives is truly keeping us from salvation, as will be the case with many people? Inside Story. Our mission story this week is titled Hunter of Souls and it's by Andrew McChesney from Adventist Mission. Danny Watley was on top of the world and not just because he worked as a bush pilot in the United States state of Alaska. Danny owned a thriving tour company that offered private hunting trips to the world's movers and shakers. Clients included Citibank's president and the Rockefeller family. I wanted to be in the elite, Daniel said. I did not want to be a regular person. I loved those people. But then he received a copy of the great controversy. Danny had dated a former Seventh-day Adventist and, through her, started playing basketball and volleyball at the Adventist church in his hometown, Palmer. A church member gave him the book. Danny took the book with him on his next bush trip and read how the Seventh-day Sabbath was changed to Sunday. He never had heard of author Ellen G. White, but he instantly felt convicted that this was truth. Back in Palmer, Danny was preparing for the hunting season when church members invited him to an evangelistic series. The opening presentation about the Daniel 2 prophecy captivated him. I was hooked right away, he said. People who say evangelism doesn't work have never been on the receiving end of an evangelism series. The next night... Danny brought his father. When the preacher, Vern Snow, spoke about baptism one night, a battle broke out in Danny's mind. He didn't want to lose clients because of the Sabbath. The battle went on for the whole meeting, Danny said. At the end, I had to make a decision. I went to Vern and said, I want to be baptized. At that moment, he surrendered everything, including his business, to Jesus. I was a hunting guy who could do it all on my own, and now I realize that I could not do it all on my own, he said. At the baptism, the pastor declared, 
Here is a trophy hunter who is now a hunter of souls. Danny's father and stepmother were baptised the following Sabbath. Other people also have joined the church through Danny's influence. At work, Danny told clients that they could no longer hunt on Saturdays. Instead, he said, they could enjoy the day in nature at no cost. With trips costing $1,500 a day, clients happily embraced the new pricing plan. Two years later, Danny sold his flourishing business. He also lost his desire to be in the elite. Your reader for this week's Adult Sabbath School Bible Study Guide has been Dr. Percy Harold. It has been produced in the studios of Christian Services for the Blind, distributed under the auspices of the Sabbath School Department by HopeChannel.com.